Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your generosity in uh, participating in this uh, workshop slash study group. Uh, especially, I want to thank uh, Sepide for uh, putting uh, this together and uh, for an object in general. And uh, also JP for accepting to, to be the special guest in this session and Cassia for hosting and moderating. And uh, well, I've prepared like a, an outline presentation that should be around 40 minutes or something. It's um, more or less based on uh, the talk that was one of the readings for this session, but I've kind of cut it down and then um, developed some new stuff that I would like to discuss with you, especially trying to interact more with uh, the other texts for this session, which were uh, Compulsive Freedom and Unfree Improvisation, or the other way around by um, Ray Brazier, and um, the video current. Well, so in this workshop, my proposal is for us to work uh, together on a theoretical experiment. This experiment uh, consists in mobilizing the conceptual apparatus of cosmological perspectivism in order to account for certain aspects or dimensions of the contemporary process uh, we are used to call platformization. This is still a very tentative, a very um, preliminary project. I have sketched it for the first time in this talk that's, saving, that's serving as the base for this workshop titled Platforming and Perspectivism, but it's still um, very much a work in progress. Um, this I think is what's interesting about this workshop format um, to bring in an ongoing project so that we can work on it together, right? I'm sure discussing with you will help me a lot to continue developing it. And I hope that you um, can take whatever we, we managed to put together here and move it forward in your own uh, projects, right? So this project stems from the intersection of two lines of research that I've been developing for some time now. One is what I call um, platform nomics which is the study of platforms in nomic terms, which is to say, in as much as platforms constitute an order, which is at once uh, legal, political, technical, spatial, and cosmic uh, in the sense of the building of worlds. Right? This uh, is an approach from the point of view mainly of legal theory and the philosophy of law, though it's quite uh, mixed with other debates and influences. And the second line of research has to do with non-modern ontologies, um, what Viveiros de Castro calls the decolonization of thought, and more specifically, the relation between cosmologies and technology, which has been explored by Yuk Hoi in terms of what he calls cosmotechnics. So um, let me start with some preliminary definitions of the two main terms which we'll be discussing throughout. So platforming and perspectivism. And this session is going to focus on platforming the next one more on perspectivism. Um, I use platforming to refer to a specific set of operations through which platforms institute themselves as such. Um, and I will argue that platform is defined in an important sense by the production of differences of level or differences of plane. A platform in this sense is a level or a plane which is differentiated detached, abstracted from a neutral plane of reference, which we may call a ground or the ground. Um, we will discuss this in terms of differences of plane of agency and differences of visibility. Um, by perspectivism, uh, I refer to a family of cosmologies or ontologies 
chaired by a number of ind indigenous uh, peoples from Amazonia and elsewhere with certain common characteristics as described mainly by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. We are going to be operating with a simplified model or paradigm of perspectivism, which will be based on an animal person spirit triad and a predator prey dyad. Um, in perspectivist ontologies, basically to advance what we're going to discuss more deeply next session, um, basically everyone or everybody appears as people or as a person to themselves and to their own kind. We appear to ourselves as people and others like um, say jaguars or peccaries appear to themselves as people. Uh, and beings of other kinds usually appear to us as either animals or spirits. Though in normal circumstances, spirits are invisible. So to say that they appear to us as spirits is usually to say that they do not appear to us or that they appear to us in very um, fleeting uh, ways, right? Um, it's, it's also possible to uh, see those others as people or to actually see them as spirits, though this implies uh, that the situation is already not normal. And my hypothesis um, in this project is that the conceptual apparatus of perspectivism may allow us to unpack contemporary platform ontologies in ways which are relevant or couldn't, uh, which are relevant and, and that couldn't necessarily be obtained in the same way through uh, other conceptual schemes, right? Uh, and this experiment rests in the affirmation that perspectivist thought can't be reduced to a cultural curiosity or a parochial prejudice or to or something that has to be uh, supplanted by more advanced concepts um, or as a set of beliefs which might be uh, interesting, exotic, but corresponding to some um, archaic world which has nothing to do with our planetary, technological, and uh, complex society. Um, like on the contrary, like I think the interest of the so-called ontological turn in anthropology to some extent is in emphasizing the contemporary potential, potential of those uh, non-modern cosmologies, uh, include, include, including as a philosophical project or as a conceptual apparatus which can be uh, mobilized in different contexts and, and in relation to all kinds of, of questions and problems and experiences. So our goal is not to romanticize indigenous thought like it's going to give us some kind of uh, redemption, but to navigate its possibilities in relation to some concrete uh, problems. So in this first session, we are going to focus on platforming and specifically in how platforming produces two types of level differences, differences of plane of agency and differences of degree of visibility. Um, and then in the second and last session next week, we'll draw from cosmological perspectivism as a conceptual framework to articulate and navigate those differences of agency and visibility. So this is the theme of today's uh, session, functional abstraction and differences of visibility. Functional abstraction in the sense of how differences <coughs> of planes of agency are produced and maintained as such and differences of visibility, both in terms of seeing and of being seen. One of the readings for this session was the video current, um, because I think it provides an especially um, re rich um, image um, of the kind of platform world we are speculating about. 
and the perspectival differences uh, that it implies. Also, the whole discussion which has been taking place the last couple of weeks about the idea of the metaverse uh, has a lot to do with this, if you want to think of it in more concrete terms. Um, and JP is really the perfect guest for today's session since his work on world making and life forming has a great focus both on how the emergence of agents may be explained in terms of uh, what I'm calling functional abstraction and in how perception and aesthetics play out when radical differences of scale come into play. So it will be an opportunity for me as well to, to think through my approach to these questions in, in dialogue with JP. So I'm going to present this in two steps, like first platforming as functional abstraction and differentiation of planes of agency, and then platforming as differentiation of visibilities. So first, uh, differentiation of levels or planes of agency, which corresponds to section uh, 2.1 of uh, the, tr the transcription of my, my talk. Uh, it was especially thinking of this and also um, to set up a good interface with JP's uh, concerns that I assigned Ray Bracer's on free improvisation, compulsive freedom as a reading for this uh, workshop. So um, let, let me just uh, see something here to see if, I, if I've got the right version. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's good, sorry. Just because I was thinking that maybe I had the, the other version of this presentation. So, okay, first thing is, what's a platform? First, I should distinguish between um, two senses in which I discuss platforms. There's a broader sense in which a platform is simply a detached plane or level in which certain functions are afforded which are different from what we may call a ground level or simply a relatively lower level of, of abstraction. And then there's a specific contemporary sense, uh, which we might, for lack of a better term, call algorithmic platforms. Those platforms produce abstraction in a particular way, which has to do with algorithmic governance or what sometimes I call um, algorithmics. So the most basic sense of platform is simply a detached surface, right? Or plane, which may serve as a ground or analogous to a ground, but which is removed when in relation to the level of ground. Um, when we, and then um, from there, we speak of political platforms, which constitute the possibility of acting collectively on a political level or technological computational platforms, which afford cer certain uh, utilities or functions by formalizing uh, matters and, and, and um, technologies. And then business platforms, which also like uh, facilitate certain transactions by formalizing them. So all of these uh, function by affording a special plane where certain kinds of actions become possible. Um, in my presentation paper, I discuss uh, moder modernity as a platform. Now, we may also say that language or normativity or reason or humanity as such is a platform in, in this particular sense. Uh, normativity um, produces the plane of reason or freedom or culture as functionally detached in relation to nature. And that is possible because rules that were simply exemplified as patterns abstract themselves from those patterns and start to uh, act as reasons for acting. So, so if there is uh, such a thing as what Latour uh, has famously called the constitution of the moderns, 
the nature and culture, the vision and all that. That's not simply by fiat or because of ideology or discourse, but because a certain platform is constructed through the organization of networks of constraints. Uh, when we call this, uh, um, like I, I'm choosing to call this drawing from uh, Carl Schmidt, a certain nomic order or what Schmidt calls a nomos. Um, we, we might call this like the modern nomos, you know, or the humanist nomos. Uh, and we may argue about what's the correct time frame to situate it, but anyway. My working hypothesis in any case is that the current process of platformization might constitute a proper nomic transition. That is, uh, that the diagram of constraints which structures our, our worlds might be changing to such an extent that the modern way to separate the planes of culture and nature, normativity and causality, uh, human subjects and non-human objects might begin to lose its grasp of some of our concrete experiences and, and problems. So, well, how do uh, algorithmic platforms produce themselves as functionally abstracted planes of agency? I'd say that paradigmatically, the they, they, they function by formalizing or coding certain functions and making them available to potential users. For example, uh, Uber codes functions such as taking a ride and offering a ride. Uh, and often this is done by taking a pattern of behavior from the social milieu uh, and coding it in the form of a computational platform in the form of an application. Um, platforms instantiate their applications in devices, whether personal, mobile, or distributed in all kinds of spaces. Um, devices um, marry organized matters as uh, hardware and form functions as software. Software overcodes itself in a series of layers until in the most elevated layers of the software stack, applications then offer formed functions to users. These are phenomenologically manifested to users in the form of user interfaces. Um, applications are software, right? Um, that means uh, for me that they are formed functions. Their specificity among software is that they have a double implementation. So they correlate to different, to two different types of organized matters. Not only their hardware on one hand, but also potential users or what I call deems, which emerge from a social or demic milieu. Um, demic is like D-E-M-I-C, like from demos. Um, hardware, both in my phone and elsewhere, you know, in the cloud, implements Uber by executing the necessary commands for its functioning and users implement Uber as well by taking and offering rides, right? So the user in my sense is a two-sided figure. There is a user form, which is coded and embedded as a part of the application on the platform. This is made of rules, basically. And, and there is a user content which emerges from the social milieu to actualize itself as a user on the platform. So before relating to the user form, the potential user is not necessarily a subject, uh, but simply part of an indistinct uh, demic multitude. 
even if he is a subject on some level. Um, in my work, I tend to conceive of what I'm calling the social milieu or deems as a multiplicity considered in terms of its potentialities or virtualities. So like in this kind of Deleuzean sense, basically. There are always N conducts which could emerge from Adamic uh, milieu. And what platforms seek to do is to map out the relevant variables and parameters which make it uh, so that this makes it possible for them, the platforms, through uh, strategic interventions to actualize certain conducts as opposed to others. So social patterns are made into rules which become embedded in the computational structure of the platform. And it starts to act on the social milieu to produce in the sense of bringing forth, you know, produce in the sense of bringing forth the potential analogous conducts uh, along with their implied agents. Social patterns uh, embedded in the computational platform act on the social milieu to bring forth conducts and with them the agents which are implied by those actions. It would seem that those rules are abstracted and start to circulate on a functionally autonomous level, even though they are not embedded or represented in human brains or consciousnesses. There seems to be a sort of involution in the sense which Bracer uses a lot, but on a different level or perhaps on multiple levels. And those levels don't necessarily correspond to the scale of the human biological individual, and they're not obviously submitted uh, by conscious deliberation. Um, they're not obviously submitted to, to, concert, to conscious um, deliberation by any human agents. And I mean here human in, in a biological sense, like in, a, in the sense of the biological human individual, uh, we might um, discuss what, what we are going to call human and whether we should call all agents humans in the sense simply that to act is to be a human, right? This, this, um, this particularly mode, this, this, this particular mode of abstracting and circulating rules is what some authors have been calling algorithmic governance, in which sometimes I like to call simply algorithmics. Um, note that, of course, all of the processes which involve algorithms aren't necessarily algorithmic governance, right? Algorithmic governance is a more specific process related to what we are observing in, in technological platforms today, but, you know, like, a cake recipe is an algorithm and it's not algorithmic in this sense, okay? Uh, so algorithmic governance platforms are often considered to operate in three phases. They formalize functions and offer them to potential users. Then they gather large ma masses of data from the conducts that they sustain and they extract statistical correlations from those data. And finally, um, on the basis of those correlations, they act upon actions so as to actualize certain types of potential conducts from the social media. This uh, is not to say that social life is formless in itself, right? There are, of course, very many structured and formalized functions already going on in societies, otherwise they wouldn't be uh, societies. Uh, many of these are rule following, and in this sense, uh, free conducts performed by humans who see themselves and recognize each other as subjects or agents. Um, but it seems to me uh, that seen from the point of view of algorithmic governance agencies, 
those same actions might become relevant as patterns, or if you will, they might appear as patterns rather than as uh, free actions. It doesn't matter uh, for, to the platform. It doesn't matter so much if you, if, if for you uh, clicking a like uh, or calling an Uber is any more uh, voluntary than say uh, having certain eye movements when uh, confronted with an ad. Uh, for the platform, all of those count as patterns which in as much as they can be correlated to multiple analogous patterns uh, and that they can be triggered with a certain reliability on a population of potential users, uh, they allow the controlled circulation of rules to the platform, which constitutes its mode of governance. So the point here, um, which we're going to retake next session, is the hypothesis that the multi-layer and decentralized platforming we are seeing may produce platformed agencies and users on multiple different levels, acting on variable planes or scales, so that what counts to each of them as a free action or as a causal pattern may vary according to their relative positions in the diagram of a multi-platform socio-technical uh, milieu or assemblage, right? So that was the first half of it. And then we go into platforming as the differentiation of visibilities. And it was then especially thinking of this part that I assigned the current video as a reading for this session. Um, if you haven't watched it, I would encourage you to open the video on another window and maybe let it play without sound. Um, it's available on current.cam slash film, current.cam, C-A-M slash film. Um, and well, <clears throat> So um, current is meant and executed as um, a cinematic speculation about the future of uh, cinema. They use this word broadly conceived based on the intersection of a number of uh, current tendencies in the technologies of visibility, such as um, virtual and augmented reality devices, such as glasses, optical implants, uh, headsets, uh, algorithmic curation of content feeds, volumetric cinema, deep fakes, streaming culture, and uh, the possibility of the decentralized uh, financializing of the visible through uh, cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. So it's really like imagining all of those things coming together and, and, and uh, composing on each other. And the result is, uh, I think they, they, they capture something really uh, interesting and Im imaginative there. Like uh, also like, uh, I'd like to, to thank the, the, the people who made current there, like a team that worked with uh, Strelka Institute um, and they helped me uh, advertise this this workshop as well like I asked them to use the, the video and, and all that like unfortunately I'm not sure if they were able to be here like if any of you are there then it would be nice also to hear uh, a bit of your impressions about this discussion um, but well yeah so uh, this is like a visualization from which we can uh, we can make this thought exercise, right? And also in the last couple of weeks, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about the notion of the metaverse, which of course has to do uh, with this whole discussion. Although um, Zuckerberg's version of it is like ridiculously parochial and unimaginative. Um, 
in any case, the, the, the fundamental premise seems to be that platforms cease to manifest through screens to us, right? Uh, and they, they go into this field of augmented and virtual reality interfaces, which are superimposed to our general life world, right? Vision isn't necessarily the only or the most important aspect of this, but it seems to be a key dimension that the, at least uh, in this initial development, um, it's above all the headset, which is the privileged device, uh, even if other types of sensorial input may be added through other technologies. But in any case, this apparent privilege of visibility um, also correlates to a privilege of visibility in perspectivism. So we are kind of um, drawing on this on this particular focus, right? Or this uh, coincidence of focus. Um, and well, basically to connect it to, to the previous section, uh, it would be impossible for users to meaningfully act on the level of platforms if they didn't receive some significant sensory input corresponding to the relevant plane or on which they are meaning to act or the scale in which they are acting. Uh, what objects can they interact with? What are the available actions? What are their limits? You know, in many cases, uh, they should also be uh, perceived by others operating on the same plane so they can have uh, meaningful interactions with them. So all of this happens through uh, what we call user interfaces. And therefore, uh, the platforming of actions seems to imply some sort of corresponding platforming of sensation, which is a question of interfaciality. Uh, in my talk, I introduced the notion of regimes of visibility through the paradigmatic modern visibility technology that Foucault's and Bentham's uh, panopticon. Um, that's a very uh, well-known philosophical trope, uh, so I'm going to skip it in this presentation. And well, in any case, the it's 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 common like today to to affirm that the internet the smartphone uh, or uh, what have you is a prison or is a panopticon. Uh, there's like a whole uh, hype around concepts such as surveillance capitalism. And I think that is, 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 is trying to interpret the regime of visibility of algorithmic platforms uh, as what Foucault called a disciplinary regime. closer to what Foucault uh, defined as governmentality or what Deleuze called control. Instead of fixing differences of visibility through uh, static architectures, um, algorithmic platforms distribute visibilities and sensibilities by mapping statistical correlations. Um, within large populations of human and non-human agents, that constitute a demic milieu. And then uh, modulating flows of vision and sensibility based on those correlations. Uh, it is no longer a question of fixing differences of visibility, but of constantly redistributing visibility according to recursive um, probabilistic diagrams. Um, You froze the, not sure what happened here. Yeah, he's frozen, at least for me. Yes.
Well, he left, and then I think he's going to rejoin in a few se seconds. Yes, he's here. Hi, Zach. Hi. Uh, think, your I connection think... broke at uh, recursive probabilistic diagrams. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I don't know what happened. So let me see. Okay, so machine vision and deep fakes, as well as AI generated art, um, can give us good examples of this uh, regime of visibility of platforms. Um, for example, when we have to prove that we are not robots, uh, we we are helping anonymous uh, anonymous. We're helping helping uh, autonomous vehicles to learn to see by pointing out to visual patterns uh, corresponding to cars, traffic lights, crosswalks, etc. Um, in order to be able to see faces, algorithmic platforms uh, have to feed from our faces as we put them to use on uh, platform social interaction. And then these faces allow AI to um, produce uh, realistic human faces which don't belong to anyone in particular. So there's like a whole machinic imaginary or a delirium, you know, what has been called a deep dream, uh, which is mined by platforms from uh, the social milieu and which then serves uh, serve not only as a foundation for pattern recognition, but which may be circled back productively, as we see in current, for example, in the form of an algorithmically curated visual experience. Um, the metaverse debate is interesting here precisely because of how much uh, of Facebook's or now uh, Meta's presentation, don't know if you've seen that, uh, doesn't show those possibilities. Uh, in the depiction they've chosen to show of the metaverse, the main organ of social platforms is nowhere to be found, um, which is the algorithmically curated feed. Of course, uh, it's nowhere because it would for sure be absolutely everywhere. Uh, experience in general would be an algorithmic feed, but understandably, they don't seem to be in a hurry to show us uh, what that would probably look like. Um, Zuckerberg shows us a metaverse, which is highly inclusive and egalitarian, but actually uh, what we seem likely to see, I think, is a radical augmentation of the possibilities of differentiation and discrimination. And differently platform users may live in completely different worlds, even as they share the same physical space. And they may to some extent share the same virtual space, but with very different uh, conditions. Even how one user appears to the other, and this is going to be important for us, would probably be a, a function of the correlation of their respective data profiles and how they correlate to the rest of the social graph, to use Facebook's expression. This is already the case in uh, what I'm calling a metaversalist project like matters, uh, which would be, you know, a universalism of the metaverse in which you, you, it, it should be unified to a single platform. Uh, if, however, we think of the possibility of multiple uh, non-unified metaverses, what we may call a platform multiverse or something like that, the negotiation of visibilities becomes much more complex even. 
So how human and non-human users linked to different platforms may appear or not to each other in this context would seem to not only vary widely from user to user, but uh, from moment to moment, depending on the diagrammatic configurations that inform their conditions of interfaciality at any uh, given moment or uh, juncture. This, along with the differentiation of planes of action, which seems to accompany it and to some extent to be indiscernible from it, uh, is what in the next session we are going to seek to unpack by drawing from the conceptual apparatus of cosmological perspectivism. Uh, for now, though, uh, I would like to hear your thoughts about what I've presented here, and hopefully we can go on developing these questions in a collective manner. Especially, I'm very interested in what JP's thoughts are going to be on this, uh, since, as I said, he has done some important work on these uh, themes of abstraction of agency and of sensibility, both uh, in political and aesthetic uh, terms, right? Uh, so maybe we can start with JP's um, reaction and comments. And I think he, he said that he, he had brought also like a small text to to present um, that has some relation to this. So yeah, that would be um, my initial presentation. Uh, thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks for having the invitation again. Uh, yeah, um, I, let me let me let me think how how should I start this. Um, Yeah, I, I take it that you invited me, but well, you, tell, you, you just told that, that uh, it has to do with my work, my work in world making, these kind of things and, and scales. Um, what I think is striking is that, uh, of course, uh, I think you can, it's uh, compatible to what you are doing. I mean, this uh, multiscalar thing, multiscalar thought and world making and all of that. But uh, it's what, what I find it uh, interesting is that what is actually a problem for me is in a sense solved by the platform, so to speak, I think. For instance, one of the most interesting uh, issues uh, regarding uh, world making and the relationship of world making and scale, of course, for those who are not uh, familiar with this idea, uh, I'm. I'm mentioning my engagement with, for instance, uh, the thought of Nelson Goodman, the idea that our uh, form of uh, access to the world is always conceptually mediated and, of course, sensibly mediated, and that these mediations, in a certain sense, uh, inform what we see and the things that we can do with what we see. So this is a very, very, very cursory uh, understanding of what making that sense. Of course, uh, in the thought of Nelson Goodman, this comes with uh, a set of different issues in, 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 you know, the philosophy of language, the problem of uh, ontological commitment within different frameworks, like you have a certain framework where you have a certain kind of object and the, in the other framework, you're not, you do, you're not counting those objects in that framework. So, the idea, uh, the way Goodman is compatibilizing these, uh, these, these worlds is, in a certain sense, not compatibilizing them. He's, he's, he's sustaining the idea, he's, uh, he's upholding the idea that you have uh, several true worlds, even if they are incompatible. So this is a kind of a difficult idea, kind of radical idea, difficult to uh, sometimes uh, make sense of, but yeah, you don't really have the time to delve uh, deeper into that. But I take it that this is, this is the motivator for the invitation, right? And one of the most interesting things that, uh, uh, I mean, I was engaged in 
was, for instance, at a certain point in your text, I, I find that funny, uh, quite like that. You mentioned how uh, supposedly scientific societies such as ours uh, don't really understand the workings of a pandemic or things like that, the, the agency of a pandemic. So this is an example of what is not given, right? Like uh, there is a certain agency that is called it an agency, uh, or the spreading of a certain virus. We can, I mean, unify it in a certain form of abstraction, the pandemic, whatever, something like that. And it has a certain kind of behavior and a certain set of constraints for its uh, spread, right? And uh, we are supposed to take it as real because it has real consequences, right? So one of the most pressing issues is the uh, difficulty in taking it as real. I, I take your phrase to, to mean just that. So uh, this is this is why this is where I really see um, in my work at least the um, uh, usefulness of world making, which is a certain in a certain sense what I'm calling lately a tentative thesis. I'm not I'm not really sure about that thesis yet. I mean of the, of its cogency, but it is the no um, no privilege scale thesis. So everything we see, everything we touch, every everything we experience comes in through multiple scales at once. So uh, there is a kind of a certain cognitive desideratum, which is we shouldn't privilege any one scale as being the one scale where this appears. Of course, when we uh, fine grain our access, like we want to, I'm talking to you as a person, so I'm fine graining, you see, my seeing as, and seeing uh, your avatar here in this platform, as a person that to, to whom I'm talking to, right? So of course you are choosing a certain level of resolution uh, with phenomenon with phenomena uh, to which you are uh, having a certain relationship, right? But at the same time, ontologically, we shouldn't really uh, presuppose that we have um, adequate access to the proper scale of any phenomenon. And the problem of the pandemic is relevant in, this, in, in that sense. Like one of the difficulties is that since we are not trained to think multiscalarly, to you know, understand things, to have this, all, all these different uh, levels, uh, usually we are just uh, caught in this image of thought that is the image of thought of the relationship between individuals and all you have are or in individuals, you don't really have like that, which you, is either infra individual or supra individual. In the pandemic, is both, which is this is it's precisely not individual. It is individual only in the sense that the individual actions impinge upon its future, but it's not visible in in that in that uh, specific. I mean, at least not for us who are not uh, uh, working in public health, for instance, of course. Uh, but we don't really have a grasp, like a firm grasp of what, what does it mean and what are its visible, uh, visible uh, results, you see. So one of the interesting things is to come up with degrees of resolution that makes legible certain processes, right? This is a philosophical project. And uh, I think what you are doing is kind of the opposite. Not, this is not a critique. I'm just trying to describe it. Like you're saying that in a certain sense, a platform is something that makes these decisions for us in a certain sense. And this is why I tend to think they are like wiring diagrams in a certain sense, like they are uh, constraining possible moves and possible chains of action within the parameters set by the platform itself. Of course, it has an enabling factor, as you mentioned, like with Uber, you can, I don't know, uh, maybe have more urban mobility, but at the same time, uh, it constrains a lot of different uh, different uh, points of action. Okay. So this is a kind of interesting thing. You are kind of uh, using it to think of material material media that is actually constraining uh, behavior. And you said you said visibility. I, ha I have a, a little bit more of an issue with that, with the visibility side, because in every 
in all the examples that I can come up with, uh, the visibility is pretty impoverished, right? It's just, you know, avatars and representatives for whatever, maybe a bot or maybe a person or something like that. If we are thinking of online platforms, for instance, so visibility is, is quite impoverished, uh, I'd say. And, uh, but then you have the second concept of visibility. It's not just visibility in the sense of seeing, seeing as that deals with uh, resolution degrees, which is something that we are enmeshed with in our everyday you know, phenomenology. But is also, it is also, uh, the platform is making visible in the sense of be, making it available or not. So there's, there's, there is information that is not available. So it's a different kind. It's not really a multiscalar kind of visibility. It's more like a, this, the, the scaling is in the data that decides upon whether we have access to a certain information or not, right? In that sense. So it's, there's a, a little modulation of conceptual, uh, conceptual function there for uh, the scaling factor and what does it mean, what does it mean to have a certain kind of visibility there? Because if we don't really have like degrees of visibility, right? We, we have like, we are either an information is available or not. Like sometimes when you post some, something in Facebook and nobody sees it and you don't have, you have no engagement. So this is all, already kind of usual parlance. Oh, it's because of the algorithm. They are, they are not uh, making it visible to others and things like that. And this is the interesting thing that I see also that you, you are uh, coming up with this recursive concept of uh, a certain recursive. Um, I, was, I was always going to say scale, but I'm using scale for this other thing. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to come up with a different uh, word. Um, a recursive criterion, criterion. Like you have like a, a certain scale of resolutions, of possible resolutions, and you are uh, updating this scale in terms of uh, what actually is happening in the behavior of the network itself. So this is something that I, I see you're doing. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, in order for you to have like this updating, it seems to me that you, you must have, of course, you have like this perspectivist uh, framework, but it seems to me you're, you're, you're arguing against a certain rigidity or fixity of uh, criteria for visibility and for action, therefore, in, in platforms. At the same time, you must, it seems to me, you, have, you must have like a certain rigid meta criterion in order for it to decide upon at which point what is the criterion that is governing the regime of visibility in a certain time point, you see. So uh, within multiscalar thinking, I, I, the, the, I mean, the, I, I was going to read something, maybe, maybe I still will, I'm not, not sure. But what I think is kind of the, the crux of, the philosophical crux of the issue for me is whether pure perspectivism is able to think that, or if we need uh, actually, and you, I think you are already doing that, like conceptual bootstrapping out of the perspective, because you have to be able to think the scale that is not readily available to a certain perspective. And then you, what you're doing is the coming up with different framework where, where these perspectives are legible. So it's not really pure perspectivism in a certain sense, even though there is a perspectival reality to it. And I agree with that. I think this is important. But at the same time, it's not, it's not uh, you are not limited to your perspective. You are trying to come up with the means by which perspectives are determined within the platform, you see. So uh, this is maybe there is a certain internal tension there between the first part of your work and the second part. I'm not sure. So this, this, this is a question for you. I think a question that I already posed a few days ago, but in a different kind of uh, less uh, fleshed out uh, way, right? And uh, I think there's a tension there, for instance, um, what I was going to mention, and uh, while I was reading your text, I, I, I was reminded of this project that I had that was postdoctoral project that didn't get picked by the institution that I was uh, trying to get into. 
uh, but uh, I think it's quite uh, there's there's a lot of other things in common. But at the same time, there's this um, um, not really a, a view from nowhere, uh, but a kind of uh, functional bootstrapping out of the view of, of a specific view, localized view, right? And this is something that. Uh, is coming up with a lot uh, in a lot of different dialogues I'm having with different different people. Like for instance, it came up with uh, Elon when I was responding to his new book. That you, um, it is. It seems to be part of your part of the perspective of a concept monger that he's able to navigate in a localized totality as well. Like he's able to construct a map. You see. Uh, so this is, uh, I'm not sure there is really a tension there. What are the caveats to have like pure perspectivism in order to deal with this? But it seems to me that you need to have like, for instance, the point of view of the platform or the point of view of that which defines the platform in a certain sense. And this in your world here that you are building, it seems to be like the point of view of the whole in a certain sense. And uh, even if uh, degrees of criteria, criteria for degrees of visibility are uh, recursively defined, which means they are uh, changing, it seems to need like a meta language for that, like a meta criteria that will define these degrees of length, or de sorry, degrees of visibility, right? So in my text, I was saying something like that. Organiz I was talking about organization. So organization is a multi-registered notion that encompasses an aesthetic dimension, the sensible perception of order and disorder, an epistemological dimension. What does it mean to know something and under, under what measure is it coextensive to organizing informational inputs? And an ontological dimension, what distinguishes and defines the various systems that compose the organization fabric, organizational fabric of the real. The basic wager of the project is that within a generic account of organization, there lies multiple forms of reductions that make intelligible the scaffolding of a cognitively integrated form. So you have to reduce in order to individuate a certain resolution. But this should not be understood as proposing a static opposition between what is form and what is content, as scale makes something different of forms. Can you, can you go back a little bit, just because like my audio cut for okay, a while. And okay. part of it. When, when, where, what was the last thing you... You to I don't know, just like uh, a little okay. bit back. So uh, the basic wage of the project is that within the generic account of organization, there lies multiple forms of reductions that make intelligible the scaffolding of a cognitively integrated form. But this should not be understood as proposing a static opposition between what is form and what is content, as scale makes something different of forms in that it supersedes particular perceptual capacities or rearrange perceptual inputs in a way that changes its conditions of intelligibility altogether, demanding the participation of the concept. Content is thus positionally defined as that which is being reduced through the participation of logical form at a particularly explanatory level or scale. For here comes, from here comes the idea of a diffractive investigation. As we move from magnitude to magnitude, we are also moving from an immediate sensible to a mediated intelligible and back from an immediate intelligible to a mediated sensible. What was once conceptually defined and became sensibly integrated as a particular seeing something as something else, seeing something as something, right? And this can be natural, naturalized or immediate because it is naturalized or it can be mediated therefore you have to build this seeing something as something else, which is the workings of world making. So according to this theoretical approach, what is at first an immediate sensible is actually relative to the transcendental apparatus at work. Form and scale is then also an investigation into the transcendental system that gives form to whatever appears. If for, is if for Kantian sensibility necessary, there was a specific scale involved in the processes to be synthesized with intervention of explanatory levels, immediacy acquires a different, albeit technical sense of being what is immediate according to a specific scale. So what's being, what, what I feel like you're doing is like uh, the, the scale of uh, resolution is given by the platform and 
In fact, what is uh, maybe a certain kind of bootstrapping because we are changing levels, as you say, uh, we, we feel it as a constraint or as a limitation because it is a wiring diagram that imposes upon possible, possible uh, moves from the agent, well, from, uh, yeah, coming from the agent, right? Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of different things here, but maybe I just, uh, I'll just uh, see what I have to say about this. Uh, so I think my two basic questions would be, uh, what is scale really in that, uh, in that framework? What, what, what does it mean to have like a difference of scale in platforms? Does a platform entail a, different, a difference in resolution or in scale really? Uh, this is a kind of a question that I had. Uh, second one would be, is it compatible to, you know, a Vivarian, Vivarian let, let, us, let us call it Vivarian perspectivism, the idea that to have access to these different scales is not just to change agents, to change the point of view of the agents that are in the map, but to change the point of view within the same agent. Like, uh, I, am, I have to change my point of view using a certain set of uh, uh, abilities, conceptual abilities, for instance, to, to teach myself to see something as something else, for instance. Like it's not immediate, it's not just immediate perspective. Like if I'm looking at a prey, it is like, you know, a guinea pig, or I think that's the image that Vivegas uses. Um, but to actually variate the different scenes as uh, within the same agent, but not necessarily determined by the relationship of that agent to either predator or prey or being of one kind of or different kind, like human or human. Not just that, but deliberately changing, uh, trying to change what the transcendental system in question is getting. Right? Uh, it seems that uh, your work is not thematizing that, specifically because the platform is supposed to be doing that. But in order for you to thematize the platform, you have to do what I'm saying that you need to do, right? So <laughs> you, you, you have to be able to get out of your own scale in order to describe the platform, even if the platform is doing all the work. And because the platform is doing all the work, it's kind of double-edged sword-like. It has enabling condition, but we also feel like it's a kind of wiring diagram that uh, represses desire in a certain sense and kind of direction uh, directions the flow, so to speak. And you have like several mental health issues coming out of it and things like that. Uh, yeah, I think those are the two questions, the compatibility, the scaling, and the role of the concept, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what to, what, how many questions you, you gather out of this? So yeah, let's see what you have to say. Uh, that, that's already a lot. Like, uh, thanks JP uh, for first for being here and for your attention and your response and questions. This is very uh, interesting and important. I think to like, I think this whole idea and this whole line of research already has to do like, you know, today I got like this, uh, platform mediated uh, memory of a post that I did exactly one year ago where I was already like tagging you on uh, a passage of Viveiros where he's talking about uh, the role of form of life. So yeah, this is a discussion. Yeah, and I, found an, I, and I found a different, a different conversation from the next day that I just posted there as well. <laughs> right. So just the next day, like uh, tomorrow, like 30, 364 days ago. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, wow. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a long discussion that we've been having and also with other people and with other contexts that uh, I, I knew that it was going to come up here, but I think like I should say uh, right away that I think my answer to the main and the biggest question is going to take up basically the next session, like because in this one, we didn't really get into perspectivism right like uh you you know that i'm kind of trying to to make this compatible with perspectivism but at the same time 
what I'm presenting here mostly has more to do with my previous work on platforms, which, as you might have noticed, has, you know, like Foucauldian, Deleuzean elements, and then there's the Schmittian element. Um, there's a, I, yeah. I was missing Kelsian elements, but okay. Yeah, yeah, there's there, there's there's like uh, some of that as well, you know, um, and then I'm trying to see, you know, and this is basically the question, which is uh, an open question and and like one for us to work on in this workshop, which is to to what extent and with what consequences are those things compatible? Like, what happens if I take this picture that I was already working on? Uh, of what I'm calling like platform nomics and try to set it uh, in a perspectivist framework. And I think in principle, it could perhaps be compatible in the sense that Viveiros de Castro's reconstruction of uh, Amerindian perspectivism through his, you know, ethnographical anthropological a procedure is uh, considerably uh, articulated through a delusion uh, vocabulary, even though it's not the same, like it's not so much, uh, you know, strata and, and form of content, form of expression. I draw from this also a lot in this presentation, in part because uh, I, I was trying to draw from previous workshops here at Foreign Objects. So if you take Ray Bracer's workshop, he's already discussing his reading of Deleuze and Guattari, which focuses a lot on how rules operate there and, uh, and stratification and the bifurcation of forms of content and expression, which is a lot of the framework that I'm uh, developing platforms through. But Viveiros de Castro talks more about, you know, intensities and perspective, you know, other, other elements of uh, Deleuzean uh, thought. So, it remains an open question. Like I would really like to know uh, whether he thinks of perspectivism in terms compatible with this a thousand plateaus um, metaphysics of uh, you know the, the geology of morals, which is a scalar scalar thinking. Yeah, while uh, Viveiros has a sometimes a kind of a militant uh, anti-scale thing in the sense of ontological anarchism or that was my point kind of underlying point of the question yes i mean yeah you are you're absolutely right that's a good i think that's a good uh, passage between Deleuze and Viveiros it seems more uh more intuitive than you know going to goodman or whatever like because uh, Viveiros is already using Deleuze uh, uh resources but yeah that's a good that's a good question if if Viveiros is uh Deleuzeanism is a multi-scalar Deleuzean even as Deleuze's own. It's a kind of interesting question, yes. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to ask him that, you know, at some point, if, if possible. Maybe I'm going to tag him on, on Twitter and ask him. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, so this question, I think maybe we can keep discussing uh, on, in the next session, but I'm going to try to, 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 to focus on the more specifically um, related to, to this, uh, session which is you know let's see what i've uh, noted here like what what is a scale right well does a platform entail a difference in, in scale resolution yeah i think i think yes like uh, you know like the whole uh concept of of platform here has to do with like the, the form of a platform you know the idea of platform that's a plane uh that you have to suppose there's another plane uh, so you have to have levels, right? There's an orientation that's implied in the concept of a platform, a, a spatial orientation, okay? Uh, and this has to be, I think, cons constructed. You know, the platforms are constantly uh, trying to construct that. And there's this, aptic, this aspect of the algorithmic procedure of the platform, which is at once cognitive and constructive, right? You, 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 you're knowing and you're also governing at the same uh, time and through the same um, circuitry of uh, cognition and, and action. And then 
this is is what I call a nomic dimension to it. it it's it's stabilizing what it's what it's uh, knowing, and it's kind of producing and maintaining this difference of level as uh, sufficiently stable uh, ontological ontonomic orientation. Okay, um, so then there's uh, this. You know, uh, where was it that? You, you said at some point that um, that it's a wiring diagram, right? Uh, is is a platform like a wiring diagram? And here, I think um, that's the expression that Sellers uses for like the the B dense, right? So the, like something that's wired into, uh, so it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard for any pattern for any pattern it's wiring the area is yeah yeah okay I, I mean the b dense as the paradigmatic uh, pattern behavior rather than a rule conforming uh, rule following uh, behavior it's a rule conforming behavior that's not a rule following behavior right uh, and uh, so it's a uh, hardwired right the wiring diagram means it's hardwired in, in a way and and I think here the, the the idea of diagram is interesting because there's like those two levels of the way the platform functions it's uh it's coded in in the sense of its uh uh functional uh form like like it's, it's formalizing a function is about uh, producing a hardwired like you know a computer wouldn't work and we wouldn't have an a functioning like app if uh all of the levels of coding weren't considerably um stabilized but at the same time, when it comes to the relation between the platform and its uh, the social media to which it is applying, then the relation is, I think, diagrammatic in a different sense, which is not a hard wired diagram, but a sort of a soft diagram, like the diagram more in the sense that Deleuze and Guattari use the diagram, which is precisely the non-formed function or the tensors, you know, like this, this kind of thing that I think Ray is one of the people who have actually best uh, described in a way that makes it more uh, understandable if you're not, you know, like on LSD or something to, to understand, you know, the little So uh, this has a lot to do as well with this long discussion that we've been having about what is the relation between the world and the form of life and what's the form of life and what's the transcendental, uh, you know that that uh, I I always used to like refer in, in our discussion to uh, Deleuze's discussion of Kant, De Deleuze's courses on Kant, where uh, he's moving from the schema, like from the transcendental schema, to the diagram, and he says that you know lions are Kantian, uh, and the diagram and the schema of the lion. He's using the word schema there. He, he isn't talking about diagrams uh, yet at that point. But the schema of the lion is the um, ecology of the lion. It's like the series of uh, recursive patterns and relations that constitute uh, the territory and the ecological niche or the ethology. Or, um, and this connects a lot to what uh, Viveiros calls uh, the body in perspectivism, the body as a series of mannerisms, as uh, a habitus as uh, this diagram of uh, patterns and relations. So the part where the platform is constantly relating to the social media in terms of this uh, recursive and um, statistical, you know, based on statistical relations on probabilistic relations rather than yes or no, uh, you know, uh, hard relations. And it's constantly relation to, relating to this um, multiplicity of social life that's, you know, kind of outside of uh, the domain of, uh, of what is formally known by the platform in any, in any way. I think this um, situates, you know, the constitution and the process of constitution and reconstitution of the platform as this uh, uh, transcendental process like this delusion answer to the transcendental problem which is uh the diagram okay um I, I, yeah I, I don't know if this like makes that much sense or if i can develop it very 
um, rigorously, but uh, it's what I think. I, yeah, I think it gives a, you give me the necessary pointers. Uh, thank you. I just uh, will have to get back to the to raise a lecture on Deleuze and maybe that chapter for the next week. And uh, mm. I mean. Maybe I'll repose pose the question again next week. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. But then <laughs> I think like the, the general question is this that remains for the next session as well, which is: is there a meta criterion for orienting the relation between those planes? Because they are constituting themselves, and this is a very Schmittian theme. They're acting in a way which is at the same time spatial, political, juridical, ontological. They're acting to constitute and orient a certain spatiality, which is this difference of level. But since you have other platforms which don't have necessarily uh, negotiated, uh, pre-negotiated pre political relation with this platform, there isn't just one platform, there's like multiple platforms mm -hmm. and they are, uh, they are producing their own effects of difference of level, then uh, uh, it's not necessary I think that the relations between different levels or different platforms or different scalings are always negotiable um, from a point of view which is not that of some uh, orientation or, or some platforming. But this, I think, uh, is also going to be like a lot of the theme. Uh, well, we can uh, we can keep you know discussing this, but I think I would like to to bring in someone else, like if someone else wants to, to, to come in and then we, are, we can like go back to this or not and see what, see what happens. Yeah, I put it on the chat. So please feel free to ask questions uh, with your mic or with the chat, I, I might, I can read them. Could you please discuss the problem of scale in the Anthropocene? Do you want to come in uh, and like talk about what you mean, um, Levin? Maybe like uh, narrow it down somehow. Just so we don't feel so alone on this video platform. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, actually, it's a very general question. So whatever you have discussed, you know, just can you please relate it to the larger discussion, theoretical discussions uh, on the Anthropocene? So mm -hmm. just, you know, uh, to understand in the context of uh, uh, this broader discussion uh, yeah. related to this geological epoch. So that is, yeah. yeah. No, th thanks so much. Yeah, it has, it, that's very important, at least in my uh, research. It's not um, unrelated to the interest of bringing uh, perspectivism uh, into it, right? Because that's uh, that's often, you know, presented as a, a conceptual discussion that might somehow uh, be useful in terms of the problem of ecological crisis and all that. And at the same time, it's usually presented outside of the context of uh, technology and platforms and stuff like that. And sometimes sort of it's assumed that it's going to be like antagonistic necessarily to that, that it's not going to like traverse those levels in a way which is not simply um, negating them, right? So I'm interested in, in that. And one thing that I think connects a lot with the theme of this section concerning specifically the Anthropocene is that I like to like, it's not a very rigorous thing, but I like to play with this idea that the Anthropocene can be read or understood as the platformization of the earth in general. And by that, I mean that uh, the Anthropocene, if we understand it as the geological epoch in which the human as a species or as a project becomes of a geological force capable of affecting the conditions of the very uh, substratum that made it possible for humanity to appear out of a biosphere that was stabilized in a certain way. Um, the fact that we now become able to affect it and we, um, therefore put the very conditions of 
our mode of life at risk, in a way, uh, we find out, when we find out that we are doing this, when we become conscious through um, science, uh, you know, that uh, the Anthropocene can be considered as a reality, one, one way to understand that is that what we used to think or what used to appear to us as a ground, which is uh, a non-relative, uh, taken for granted, given uh, foundation for our mode of life. You know, if we think in terms of the geology of morals, you know, of this like emergence of those strata, uh, the anthropomorphic or allomorphic stratum uh, emerges out of a certain stratification or stabilization of the biological stratum. And when we put uh, ecological uh, stability on a planetary scale at risk, uh, in a way, this that used to appear to us as a neutral absolute ground appears as itself a platform, as something that has been constructed, that starts to be relevant to us as something that is constructed, and that we then would have to keep constructing rather than destroying. You know, it becomes uh, the same kind of, um, you know, process of organizing matters and formalizing functions and keeping them stabilized in some way, and we become involved in, in, in that. Uh, either uh, because we want to or, or outside of our control, like right now, apparently outside of our capacity to rationally and, and consciously act to control the way. But then there's a problem of whether we can take actual uh, control in some way of this situation, which then uh, brings up, you know, the kind of uh, terraforming project that's articulated by the more, you know, accelerationist uh, um, projects such as, you know, Benjamin Bratton's projects and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's, the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to articulate and bring into dialogue those usually um, very uh, split uh, preoccupations and, 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 and lines of, of, of theoretical uh, thought, right? There's any... <laughs> Yeah, and then and then platforms, you know, are part of that, of course. Like the the, the fact that platforms can formalize uh, stuff on a certain scale and act, you know, re recursively on the the environment that they are taking, you know, not only social but then like you know, an environmental, ecological uh, milieu and platforms can you know act upon that, like a part of our capability of acquiring a certain agency uh, to. Uh, deal with the Anthropocene, I think, has a lot to do in terms of its potentials with some kind of technological platform. So I'm trying to, to see how we can think of platforms also in a way which is not necessarily related to this idea of, you know, a, a predatory a modernity, but how else can we organize our uh, platformed uh, nomics? in a way which is able to, to come into terms with, with the problem of the Anthropocene. Thank you, thank you. So uh, uh, yeah, there is a concept called uh, platform capitalism. Uh, platform capitalism, so the thing is that uh, many scholars like Bernard Stigler uh, uh, envision alternative platform on alternative wave. So beyond the kind of, you know, dominant, you know, digital sphere. So, uh, so within uh, the uh, the uh, like hegemonic digital platforms. So, can we uh, like you know can we organize ourselves in an alternative way, so, or we have to like you know envision uh, a different platform? So, yeah. So, within uh, the existing hegemonic platform, how can we like you know envision uh, alternative? Uh, like, yeah. So, I'm just thinking about it yeah uh, I, I i wish i knew that right like <laughs> that's like the big uh the big problem right because one thing is to imagine what platforms could do and another thing is uh what are the interests and forces which are making them the way they are right now right it's not just to to realize that they could be in a different way but like what are the actual 
economic interests and political interests which make platforms the way they are right now in this kind of you know um kind of uh, acceleration of like uh, of the maximum exploration of of social of social production right uh, to to know to know uh rational or useful or uh or sustainable uh goal right the, at the same time i i think there are already like the platforms aren't all necessarily the same thing and that we can simply assume that everything there is is you know uh predatory modernity or predatory capitalism i think things are actually uh, ambiguous and that uh, like technological transformation is really like a very uh, powerful um, vector that might create, uh, you know, revolutions, revolutions which aren't necessarily human, but which can, you know, transform the d direction that, that the things uh, take. But the way we, we might, you know, make interventions or projects about that, I think it's always contingent on our very limited capacities to even map out what's happening and to make any kind of intervention. So uh, I don't really believe in my in, in the capacity, and this is also a question of scale and of levels of visibility. You know, I don't have the capacity to map out the problem on a scale that would allow me to give a general answer to that kind of question. Right? All, all we can do is try to platform our own capacities of perception and action to gradually be able to arrive at positions where we might be able to know what to do and to do something. Right? yeah well thanks a lot very interesting uh questions uh, i think those, those are important ones yeah so kind of in uh, new delhi um uh, so here uh, we can see um a rapid uh, emergence of platform capitalism uh with you know kind of you know this uh proliferation of uh, different platforms like uber or uh, zuma to food delivery system where you know workers don't have any autonomy they are just you know controlled by you know uh, this giant algorithms so so they are just you know machines they are just acting like you know this you know robots so they don't have any agency they don't have any capacity to actually subvert the system or ima imagine the alternative so in this condition like you know how can we like envision uh, like you know agency political agency or political action or new kind of political imaginary so yeah so that is a difficult you know question because you know it's a very new system in new delhi like you know earlier uh, during 1970s 1980s like you know uh, like you know this political you know activities uh, were you know organized in a very different way but now these workers how can they do politics how can they envision alternative uh, so when they are being reduced to uh, 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 robots, basically, they don't have any autonomy. They are organized in a very, uh, uh, very sophisticated way, uh, you know, uh, with all the latest technologies and, you know, this, you know, high-end, high you know, algorithms. So, so how can they kind of, you know, uh, organize their politics? Like, so that is, that is a question, actually. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, it's really, yeah, it's really hard to think about, you know, like resistance from the point of view of workers uh, in relation to platforms like that, that work with uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic curated and guided uh, labor power. Because, uh, yeah, because you're reduced basically to a, a, a quantity or an intensity of, 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 of labor uh, of, of like energy right you're completely exchangeable by anyone else if you're going to like you know make a strike you're simply counted out of the thing and substitute like it's going to be adjusting constantly so that's that's a problem of scale right like if you're uh like in the next session, I'm going to talk about a bit like how we may appear as animals to a platform, right? In perspectivist terms, in, in terms of how uh, a prey animal is in relation to a predator or to a human hunter, or 
is simply a source of energy, a source of matter. And then for you to be able to appear otherwise, you would have to change your conditions of platform. And that's a, a problem of organizing constraints, of organizing technologies. You know, it, it, it kind of presupposes that you get out of this position of being simply a platform worker and you actually build something somehow. Uh, and then the question of how to do that is, uh, I, I think also contingent. I don't know if anyone else has uh, any, uh, I don't know, any experiences or any hopes in relation to action in the in these uh, terms. You know, I'm not in a very uh, immediate way. I'm not very uh, optimistic. You know, <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to think of at least uh, abstract possibilities. I guess. Thank you. Uh, there's any more questions? You can write them in the chat as well. I see that Adam's here. Do you want to comment something like? Uh... I'm still digesting, digesting all this a little bit. I think that next session, especially, it's going to be interesting to to know what you what you think. Um, uh, I have some things to say. Actually, if nobody's going to jump in, I think I might say them. Uh, I was thinking regarding what you say about uh, the user form and the user content with regards to uh, and the subsequent uh, the subsequent admin admin form and admin content and so on and so forth uh, every active element of the platform uh, and the user form is embedded in the platform while the user content is given as data if i understood quite well uh, and I, th I was thinking of this distinction with regards to the concept of form of life that you used. And, uh, and in a way to disambiguate the relations that might ex exist between what you call a form of life, a way of life, and the mode of life when you, when you say uh, about the foundation of a mode of life. And because as I see the concept of form of life, he, he comes up to solve a, a problem with the concept of co concepts of culture. The concepts of culture in, in, in its uh, application is related to more local instantiations of uh, possibilities of action within a certain context. While the concept of form of life uh, refers to a more open field of possibilities because it is uh, anchored in an investigation for the simple in logic, that is what counts as following a rule. And I think that what you seek in perspectivism is already contained in this fluidity and plasticity of the form of life as an investigation of the simple in logic, of a logical step. And uh, on the other hand, uh, the adoption of uh, a metaphor, uh, this triad and dyad metaphor, animal spirit and uh, human and prey and predator, at the same time that uh, it has uh, the advantage of making us see that these positions vary according to the dynamics of the game. It uh, supplies uh, this whole dynamics with uh, undesired fixity that uh, in, the, in, the, in other case otherwise might be solved up by the very concept of forms of life that is what permits us to take different levels and di different instances as the ground. I, I was reading your text and, and uh, 
listening to this presentation was amazing presentation and amazing response by Jean, but, but these questions uh, came up uh, to me uh, while I was reading and while I was watching. Um, thanks so much, Kasia. I just realized that I had my mic open. I hope I wasn't like making a lot of keyboard noises because <laughs> um, I was like taking some notes. Um, so I'm very curious actually about the concept of form of life that you're bringing in um, as an investigation of the simple. Is that what you said? Because um, I'm not sure I can... Um, engage uh, with that because I'm not, uh, in, I'm not sure exactly what it uh, implies, but uh, in terms of like form of life, way of life, mode of life, I think, um, I think sometimes I use those in, in, in a way which is kind of interchangeable, though uh, I, I try to avoid uh, form of life when I'm talking about something which is not um, fully formalized, right? So when but at the same time, it's interesting to, to make that connection precisely when in, within this discussion that I was just having with JP, uh, sometimes the what's at stake is precisely whether uh, the life forming part of the problem is a question of something which is formed actually, or whether it's something that has a, an informal dimension like the discussion of the diagram um, implies right. So when I talk about you know uh, that the 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 user content as this uh, that as you said it's actually in the plane of what appears to the platform as data, and then uh, the, the, like I didn't discuss this in the presentation, but there's like a problem there. Of, what is data, right? And then I, I, I even like in, in my thesis, I play a bit with the, with the discussion about the myth of the given in the sense that there's this idea when, uh, when in discussion of platform and algorithmic governance, uh, like uh, data is something which is given, which is like what data means, right? Uh, in Portuguese, that's more obvious than in English, but basically the myth of the given and the myth, the myth of data is the same thing. Um, and, uh, you know, if you, if you take uh, Luciano Floridi, uh, the, the, the philosopher of information, he has a concept of data that has three um, phases. There's like three levels of data. And there's this most... Uh, uh, noumenal level of data, which he calls uh, like data for him is always a difference, uh, and 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 then there's uh, because even like the root of 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 of, of like uh, the word he uses um, diaphora de re. I don't know how you say it in latent but like that's like a difference in things themselves and then there's a difference of sign and then there's a difference of uh of 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 said like a difference of signum and different of dictum there's a difference of the sign and there's a difference of what is said but the most fundamental difference is the difference in things themselves uh and that's um in uh at least in the kind of Deleuzian uh, ontology that I'm sort of drawing from, that's basically uh, the, the fundamental dynamics of, of, of everything. You know, difference is the first, uh, the most basic element of, of any, uh, any reality or any problem or anything that we might want to conceptualize. So when platforms uh, take their environment as um, a multitude of potentials. Uh, they are mapping it out in terms of data, in terms of mapping out those differences. And then out of those differences, you get uh, correlations of, uh, of, of variables in, in probabilistic terms and stuff like that. And you start to map out uh, a graph or a diagram of uh, how one variable 
is probably going to affect others. And this, this makes it possible for you to take this formless uh, body without organs, uh, that's the external milieu of the platform, and uh, cut out of it what's going to be then the user content. And then that's going to form a user with the user form that's embedded in the application. And that's applying, that's, that's why it's called an application for me, at least, because it supplies like, like, a, like a, a cookie cutter, right? Um, and then you extract this, this agent because you make, you're making it act. That's like the Foucauldian governmentality side of it. You're, you're, you're making it act. Um, and so there's like a social life, which is, which is a very informal dimension of this. But then there's like um, formalizations which might become uh, more definite, more formalized uh, organisms or, 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 or forms of life in a, in a more formal sense. Um, but they are always dependent on this process which is uh, diagrammatic and is maintaining this all the time. Like what would be um, the, the the habitus of the lion in Deleuze's example here is a whole social life and also a whole network of um, of technologies of computational technologies that are distributed all around and that are making connections and circling those and mapping those data circling those data and also acting on them you know they're forming worlds and they're co cognizing those worlds through this recursive diagrammatic activity, the basis of which is data in the sense of simple differences, of a multiplicity of differences. I don't know if that makes uh, a lot of sense, but that's my best shot. Yeah, I just want to comment a little bit uh, on that, I think. Uh, I think the question Cassia is asking is kind of related to also a question that I was kind of asking, is it possible to change the scale of resolution? Uh, 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 one specific agent uses to come into contact with something else. It's kind of, kind of like that, you see. For instance, uh, it seems even though uh, perspectival positions vary, they vary in accord with the other, right? Like you are the lion for the others, guinea pig, or the human for the others, guinea pig, or maybe some other is a human for your guinea pig, something like that. The thing is to uh, have this plasticity wherein the, the point of view, maybe this, is, this would be the point of view of the shaman, perhaps. Uh, this plasticity of the uh, changing voluntarily your point of view in that sense, like to, to change the scale of resolution. The thing is that this is much more pedestrian than it seems to me. Like this is something we do all the time with concepts. Like we, we see things as A, B, and C, and D. If we are in a, in a labor laboratory, you are seeing something like as, as an exemplar of its uh, species or, 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 or genus, something like that. Whereas if you are in your everyday life and you're using uh, some tool you are using it for its particularity, not for its you no know, exemplary, exemplary uh, nature. This kind of thing. So we are always varying this kind of uh, point of view uh, with language, with, with concepts, and uh, things like that. And of course, uh, language and concepts are also a way to describe behavior. So we are varying it with, with our very behavior. The thing is, when we describe the behavior, we make explicit the change in. Uh, resolution that is that is going on when we behave in way A or way B or way C, you see. So this is quite interesting. Um, and yeah, uh, and I, just a, a further comment, I mean, uh, regarding the concept of forms of life, not sure if you really need to have these strictures, I mean, to have something fully formed to be a form of life because uh, and this is, of course, there's a whole debate, and Cassie is, is, is mentioning the debate, like, uh, for instance, Juliet Floyd's view of forms of life as solving a certain issue with the concept of culture, which is a specific reading. But there's also readings that uh, 
takes uh, forms of life as precisely that which is in the background and which is not really fully formed. They are not formed, fully formed. Um, my own take to, I mean, just to uh, round this thing up, is that my own take on this is that a forms of life is that which is not fully formed, but it can be made explicit, which is my Brandomian rejoinder to Wittgenstein. So when you make it explicit, you are in a certain sense formalizing it in a certain sense. And this tentative, it is a, an attempt, not necessarily you are capturing everything that's going on in the form of life, because it seems that it's background, the, the condition of its being in the background is also an essential condition. So it's in a certain sense, it ceases to be a form of life. So in, in, our, in our discussions, we are all, all, always uh, trying to make the difference between, for instance, world making and life forming. And it for me has to do with the, the process of explicitation. In a certain sense. When, you, when you make explicit, it becomes a world. And a world is like this uh, Thing, thing that hangs together for a certain uh, intentionality. So it's a taking, explicit taking things to be as something. Whereas a form of life, not necessarily. So it's much more something that is exemplified in behaviors and not necessarily we know how to objectify those behaviors. Even though I take it as, a, as an implicit uh, regulative ideal to not think of anything that is ontologically indeterminate. I, I uphold only epistemic indeterminacy. So um, uh, it, it can be, uh, at least in principle, uh, made explicit. In, this would be my take. So you have this transition between implicitness and explicitness. And this kind of transitions are also what is at stake when you change worlds, so to speak, in, in terms of your intentional object and the way you act in the way you um, thematize a certain object, you see something like that. I mean, this would be my, just a comment, really. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, very interesting. And I think it's also like helpful in terms of un like unpacking some stuff. I think I, I, I think I can agree with this concept of, of, of form of life, actually, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it seems like the making explicit in this sense or taking to be like, as you're saying, if it takes something which is kind of inaccessible and makes it accessible in one certain like formalization, which is not necessarily something that captures all of the thing in itself or something like that. Um, in a way, that's what I'm describing platforms to do, right? In, in terms of uh, if you're, if the platform takes you to be so, so, but then there's this dimension in which platforms are constantly mixing connection, co co cognition and governance in which a platform takes you to be like Uber, takes you to be uh, a Uber passenger in the sense of uh, cognizing you as an Uber passenger, but it also takes you to be a Uber passenger in the sense that it takes you by the hand and puts you in an Uber and takes you for a ride, you know? So uh, it, platforms seem to have, and this is part of their political problem, seem to have this kind of synthetic relation with the reality that they are cognizing, you know? Uh, and, and, and so um, this makes the problem of like the way they're explicitating, you know, they're explicitating to use the, the Brandomian term, they're like explicitating the society in a certain way. And they're a project of explicitating a certain society out of, like, you know, you said that the form of life uh, can be explicitated, but uh, if, we, if we take it as this uh, informality that has different potential, different vir virtualities that could or not be actualized, then to explicitate it in a certain way is a certain uh, political, cosmopolitical direction uh, or orientation, uh, which might be, you know, the same uh, Zemic milieu could be uh, explicitated by a different platform, and and, and they they already do that. You know, this Uber is explicitating ride taking, while uh, Instagram is explicitating um, social interaction and uh, image. You know, all this kind of stuff. So they're uh, you know they're unpacking or bringing forth or actualizing different aspects of this multiplicity yeah. of potentials that exist in the social. I, I agree, I can agree with that, but I feel that the, what they are doing is not really ex making explicit per se. I mean, of course, even though I, I agree that making explicit is kind of uh, 
uh, operates a kind of selection up to a point on what is being explicitated because anything that you thematize, it, it is thematized under a certain description, what, which means like the description is impinging upon what you see. So uh, ne necessarily there's a selection there. But uh, I wouldn't say that they are just uh, explicitating because they are actually selecting in the overt sense. There is a selection, overt selection going on. It's not just, you know, this is not just uh, the consequent selection upon any explicitation, but it, it, it is actually uh, the explicitation comes to the fore because the selection is first. I mean, they are kind of selecting and reinforcing behavior in certain sense. They are kind of selective hubs of behavior. Like you, you're, you're building a wiring diagram for me in the sense that you're building like a, a tunnel. You can only act in that way and not that other way. You cannot look to the left or to the right. You can only go to the front. So these are kind of hubs of action that are being enforced. And of course we accept them because, well, we have like a certain uh, goal in view. Oh, this makes life easier for this and for that. But then there's also all the unforeseen uh, consequences of, of this kind of platformization, as you as you call it. Um, yeah, just also just commenting. Yeah, Jonathan, I think that's uh, that's a good uh, point, and I think um, I, I remember something that you said that I was going to comment on. That I'm not uh, thinking of platforms really, like in your first comment. I'm not really thinking of platforms as something that's, um, I don't remember what was the word that you used, but like uh, repressing desire. Like I think in this, in this, in this way of thinking about uh, governance, it's more about like producing desire actually or circulating desire, which is uh, like, uh, you know, uh, there's like, you know, a, a multiplicity of things that might be possible. And of course, in, 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 to some extent, you map out um, what are the potentials of a society because of uh, patterns that are already there. So people already are taking cabs. You know that people are going to take an Uber because that's not a completely alien thing to that society. But at the same time, once you create a platform, you're going to extract that out of many people that would not actualize that. So you're, you're not only... Um, taking patterns and um, um, circulating or, or emphasizing them, you're actually uh, producing, like bringing this to uh, fruition out of, out of potentiality, right? So uh, there's this dimension of... of yeah, uh, I'm not sure I said repressing, but if I said so, yeah. I agree with you now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just mean that no. I don't think that I, I, I'm never thinking uh, of this as a negative thing, you know, like yeah, platforms yeah. Are something I, I, I understand are, that I all these you. platforms are constraining me. They're actually making me do things that I might no, desire, no. that I might, you know. Here's the, here's the thing. I mean, now you touched upon the thing. Like, I think it's constraining. Yes. I don't, oh, think, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> I don't think it's repressing. The thing is that, uh, like, constraint is something like, for instance, when you make a certain, uh, I don't know, when you change the course of a certain, or you create a, a, a certain ramification in a river, for instance, you are uh, channeling certain forces upon to another direction. So it is a constraint, you see this in that sense, not in the sense that you're just putting a dam in it and yeah, have, yeah. anything passes. No, nothing yeah, can pass, of course. Not, yeah, yeah. not that sense. But in the sense of constraint that you are like creating these uh, these uh, these wire and diagram where now desire can circulate only in that direction and not in any any other one. So this is this would be like the image actually. It's not it's not yeah, really pure yeah. repression. Yeah, no. The idea of constraint is just I mean you are formatting you are uh, constructing a wire and diagram for desire like you you ought to desire this and that because the network is enforcing this and that. And even, even more than that, like your freedom of movement is constrained by what the network or the platform or whatever is uh, making available or possible to do. So yeah, something like that, for instance, one, one, things, one of the things that we see a lot, for instance, is for instance, intellectual intercourses, intellectual discussions, for instance, on Twitter, like how they become so toxic, 
out of nothing. It seems that the fact that you are exposed to a, all the time exposed to a, uh, an audience, it's not just me and you like discussing, it's like we are discussing in front of an audience and there's also character limit and all of that and a certain uh, evaluation of uh, explosiveness within the 280 uh, uh, character length. So all of this uh, creates a certain recipe uh, that becomes either desirable or even uh, repulsive. For instance, like I have all the time the, the desire to, to drop out because for yeah. me it's kind of repulsive, but I see people yeah, that's, that's what you mean positively when you say... because the thing, the thing is kind of constraining. Either you do this or you disappear. Like there is kind of an, an this or the, this or, uh, either or, like an either or option that is imposed in action because of the formatting of the platform. This is what yeah. I meant. I mean, now, now it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's like what you mean when you say stuff like uh, it brings the worst of you. Like. When something brings the worst of you, you know, it, 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 there's many things you can be, but there are certain things that you're probably going to be uh, on that platform. But at the same time, I want to also emphasize, and that's what I meant when I said that the, the wiring diagram is only a part of the diagram, because I think there's this uh, more fluid diagram in which, and then depends, like it depends on what is the interest of the platform. But this is a big part of saying that a platform is not a prison in the sense that it's not a disciplinary mechanism, is that it doesn't have a pre-established format of what it wants people to be. Like Facebook is not interested in making everyone think this or that, you know, that's sometimes the problem. Like that's sometimes uh, the toxic aspect of the capitalistic uh, mode of operation of of today's uh, platforms that they don't really care uh, what you're going to to be or to do. They want you to do more things. So if they find out that if they start making you do something that like no one ever did before, you know, something that humans simply didn't do until like 2015, you know, they find out there's some, there's some new thing that that people are capable of doing if you push the right buttons and it's going to produce a lot of data. <laughs> you know, then they, they can they can nudge, you know, to bring it out of you. And that's not mm -hmm. something that's from the top to the bottom. It's not because they said, you know, we're go like they're they're starting to nudge you in that direction. But that's because they found a, a, a potentiality that was in the social media. So that's an essentially democratic uh, aspect to that. But in the bad sense of uh, democracy, you know, in the bad like platonic sense of democracy yeah i see what you mean but in a certain sense it is kind of i mean they are i i, I feel there is kind of maybe it's a problem of definition of a platform like i have i have in mind this kind of existing things that are very impoverished in terms of what is possible to do with them and the, this Wait, can, can you can you repeat like go back a, a little bit sorry sorry uh like i think maybe we have maybe the problem is like the what you really you what you really have in mind maybe we, we have different things in mind with a platform because where, when i'm saying uh talking about this constrained constrained uh thing uh nature of the platform i, I, ha I have in mind these very impoverished kind of uh, relationships that are possible within platforms. And it strikes me, of course, uh, it's not really like um, discipline. It's not, it's, not, it's not in the model of a disciplinary society necessarily. Of course, like it's not like something somebody's saying, as you just said, somebody's telling you to say this or that or do this or that. But the fact that you are constrained in your freedom of movement makes it, if you are in the platform, Either you do that or you'll get out of the platform. This was a point. So there is a kind of a compulsory nature to it, even though it's not direct, a, a direct order, things like that, mm -hmm. or something yeah, like that. Absolutely. It's more like the formatting of behavior in such a way that either you produce content or you have to go out of the platform. You cannot stay yeah, there no, without producing staying there without producing content, for instance. So something like in that in that sense. So it's still there's there's also this dimension of even though it's not in the model of a disciplinary society, but it's there's a dimension of power there, very I mean a kind of uh, mining for for data, right? 
And this is why I think it's kind of a selection on certain habits. They perform a certain selection and this selection is reinforcing certain pathways instead of others. And the reinforcement of these pathways make it uh, compulsory to follow them and to give them what they want in a certain sense. This is kind of the mining operation. It's kind of interesting, yeah. actually, theoretically speaking. Mm -hmm. No, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, that's what uh, what I was uh, discussing in the initial presentation as the, the, like the fundamental operation. The first part of the operation of the platform is formalizing functions, which is establishing a set of constraints through the application and the interface. Like it, the interface is something that tells you what are the things that you can do like to begin with. And then the whole, the rest of the thing is also that. But at the same time, since this thing is continuously being reformulated uh, in this feedback with the potentialities of the social, I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, there is this side, yes, but then uh, if, if we want to understand, you know, the political democratic problem that is posed by platforms, I think, we have to consider both the constraint part and the the what I call the demogrammatics of it, like the way it's diagramming the relation between the multiple potentialities of the social, which is like uh, the multiple. The you know this is this is uh, very close to what uh, Negrians call the multitude. You know, like the the social as this multiplicity of potentialities, which is the foundation of democracy. Like, and Negrians think this is necessarily very good. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. I think it can be uh, either. I, I think it's value neutral. <laughs> but uh, the, the problem of how you diagram democracy uh, is 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 the, the democratic problem for me. Uh, not a problem of representation, but something uh, more uh, prior in a way uh, to to that. Uh, and and then uh, how you circulate that. Uh, the problem might equally be that uh, something is, you know, uh, just taking whatever it is that we supposedly uh, desire and, 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 and making us, you know, it, it's giving us what we want in a way. Uh, and, 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 and still that might be uh, what's going to, to kill us finally, right? So <laughs> that's uh, anyway, part of the problem. Uh, I think we have uh, 20 minutes left still. If you guys have any questions, please uh, just jump in. Uh, while, while, while people might be, you know, taking courage to think, I, I remember that I didn't uh, really answer something that, and that's something that I'm going to actually develop the next session. But like, I think JP is right up when he mentioned like, uh, the, the sh shaman uh, in terms of uh, how you navigate uh, between you know ways of seeing and not perceiving like this has to do with the concept of the body right like the foundation of the perspective is uh, the body and the body considered in this diagrammatic sense that we were discussing right mm -hmm. so uh, a shamanic practice would be a way to change your perspective mm -hmm. by changing your body right it's not a question of changing your mind or your spirit primarily. It's primarily a question of changing your body, which might be operated through a chemical, um, uh, ritual, all kinds of, 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 of fundamentally somatic activities, right? And then in the platform uh, environment, I think changing your body means changing the structure of the way your platform itself you know because being platform is being a kind of cyborg assemblage of a bunch of things that constitute your capability to act on a certain level so the way you are um changing levels and changing visibility and changing um capabilities to act all the time according to these algorithmic processes is in a way a kind of a shamanic process in the sense that you're not stabilized in your perspective or in your body. Um, but then to uh, take this, this shamanic capability in your own hands to some extent would be uh, to create some kind of, of, of process that you can have some level of control, uh, right? Instead of being uh, 
dragged around by by those process which exceed us um you would have and this this is like the question of like the platform workers how are they going to rebel against the platform if to the platform they appear as an animal uh, how can they appear in another way they have to change not only um their discourse or you know they have to change their body in the sense of their platformed body you know but this is going to be like the last part of the whole thing and then you can retake this say so i have kind of a meta level question um i'm tr i'm trying to understand what exactly is going on when trying to use the indigenous concepts to understand these these concepts of technology so you're creating a kind of analogy, right, between indigenous cosmology and the way certain um, technologies function. So does that mean in, in a way you're trying to create, you know, your own platform, right? Is, is this kind of a meta platform, so to speak, in which the two can, 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 can operate together? Um, what exactly is, is sort of the motivation? Because I think that You've used the Deleuzian concepts probably more rigorously, I think, than the Veras de Castro. I, I think it like really maps on to, to what you're saying. Um, and then I also see like the the indigenous concepts mapping on really well to what you're saying. It, it almost makes me um, see the Veras's Deleuzian reading of Amazonian cosmology better, actually. Um, but then, yeah, so I'm just trying to understand what's, what's the motivating impulse exactly? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, um, in, well, in this session, I, I actually didn't really try to uh, draw from the uh, perspectivist concepts per se. You know, I'm actually going to, to, to try to do that in the next session. And like, I, it's a two-step process, right? First, establish uh, in what sense uh, we might say that the platforms produce and modulate and distribute these differences of visibility and of plane of action, and then uh, to see what this looks like if we try to look at it um, through the to this very simplified, like admittedly very simplified version of a perspectivist framework. Um, in terms of the body, the perspective, animals, spirits, prey, predator, shamanism, those, those concepts that are the ones, like the very obvious ones that ended up appearing there. And then this could, this could be, you know, further developed and, um, and become more subtle and more fine, fine grain, hopefully. But the reason to do this is, is basically to, um, Assuming, you know, taking the, the hypothesis that we are going through this nomic transition that I'm talking about, you know, I'm, I'm talking about modernity as a nomos in the sense of a certain organization of the worlds and orientation of the world, you know, like um, the way Schmidt talks about it in the nomos of the earth, you know, like the, 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 in order for the earth to become a globe, uh, it had to be made into a globe. And in order for uh, nature and culture to be distinct, that's something that has uh, come up in a certain moment. And it's not, it, it's not something that's independent from uh, certain power relations or certain relations of constraints uh, that work on multiple levels and that produces certain stability. So, uh, in this sense, like, you know, when Latour says that we have never been modern, I think he says that in a sense that, you know, we haven't been modern, like, fundamentally, but at the same time, uh, if those concepts worked for a while, you know, and, and had, like, political and, uh, and uh, epistemic um, purchase, that's because the, the world that they correspond to was not only real but was uh, enforced to some extent and that's like you know the the relation between modernity and coloniality if you will like coloniality as this 
um, other side of the platform that makes uh, modernity as a platform something that's possible. And then the hypothesis is that platformization is a sufficiently relevant uh, transition that uh, might make our conceptual apparatus, the, the conceptual apparatus of uh, modernity less capable to grasp, or at least not fully capable to grasp all of the variations and, 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 and dynamics of this new situation. And then <clears throat> it's not that uh, cosmological perspectivism somehow for some kind of magical reason is the perfect way to account for this or that it has a special relation, a special intimacy, like for some reason, you know, Amazonian indigenous peoples have some special affinity with uh, platform technology. It's not something like that, but it's simply that uh, if we are moving outside of this place where the, the you know, mononaturalist cosmology was uh, especially, uh, correspondence to the relevant uh, social, political, etc. dynamics, if we're going out of this space, then it, we might as well uh, try to recover other ways of understanding stuff and see uh, what comes out of that. So it's a kind of a pragmatist, um, it, it's done in a kind of a pragmatist spirit in, in the sense that, you know, any, any cosmology that you take and you apply it, you, you're going to get something out of that, right? Um, so I'm not saying that this is any better or even that this is going to save us somehow of the problems that, that platforms are uh, currently creating, but it might give us more versatility to deal with this situation. You know, there's uh, some point in the text, I think, where I say that, that I think that, um, the question is to have um, a, a sort of a, an ecology of cosmologies or a, a, a variety of cosmologies because when you're in a situation where you don't know what's coming, um, if you have more possibilities to um, sort of figure it out, uh, you have more uh, resilience uh, to more adaptability to deal with this, with this thing. So I just think, you know, basically it's because I'm, you know, fascinated by perspectivism as a, a framework, like as a conceptual framework, you know, because I like thought and uh, philosophy and trying to mobilize different concepts to think about things. And uh, one that I, that I want to use to think about this, and I found some initial suggestions that it might take us somewhere, which I'm trying to express here, uh, which are quite like even quite obvious or intuitive in some way, but I'm trying to like see what can come out of that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, trying, trying to do that. Like, you know, you, you, you can obviously use any other kind of concept, but like it's, a, it's in, in a way it's a choice of, you know, choosing to think with non-Western concepts just because, you know, you, you, you feel you've thought with non-Western with Western concepts enough and you want to try something different, like, you know, like just uh, uh, to, see, to see what comes out of, of that because uh, we are already doing a lot of, of other stuff. So this is one more, <laughs> one more thing to do. Yeah, what, what you're saying about nature culture is really interesting because it strikes me that, you know, someone like Bratton who has this kind of stacked layering, right? Like he can still, preserve nature culture right there's a certain version of nature culture where you just kind of start at the bottom with nature and and you just stack up towards culture and then like maybe culture has its own has its own stack it's a set like set of layers as well um could you maybe say something about like how maybe like Viveris is like inversion of nature culture re relates to the to the to the layered topology um, yeah, I think like one fundamental like cosmopolitical conflict that happens in our frequent discussions that we are having everywhere is, uh, is one we can um, formulate. And this appeared even, even in our discussion with uh, 
with uh, Breton and Lukash uh, in at uh, sheltering places um, about this question of the orientation of levels. You know, uh, I think there's something that has to do maybe with the idea of the scientific image, like the Salazian idea of the scientific image that you would, uh, even if you have all these variable manifest images that uh, the tendency would be for um, sapiens to arrive at the right uh, order of the, of the strata, you know, like the, 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 true, the true organization, the true orientation of the strata of reality. I think that's a fundamental, the fundamental question. Like, is there to be found the true uh, ordering or orientation of the strata? Uh, and you know, the, the Schmittian cosmopolitical stance, which is an anti-modern one, is to say there isn't, right? Is to say that orientation is fundamentally political uh, and that has uh, relativistic, you know, ontologically relativistic consequences, which is not to say, um, you know, like Viveros is always distinguishing between uh, like relativism in the sense of, you know, whatever you think is, is, is real is equally valid. And the idea that um, the construction of reality is perspectival and navigated as such which doesn't mean that it's just like indifferent uh or doesn't have any any um what you would call external reality but then the problem is precisely ex exteriorization and whether you you, you 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 operate on the basis of this relation between the subject and its um exteriority but i think that's the fundamental problem that we're still trying to figure out that that jp has also brought up which is is there a meta perspective or uh or are you always going to be um orienting those even if you have strata and if you have differences of strata are those always oriented from an incorporated point of view and then navigation is also incorporated. Um, yeah, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think the way in which, and we were talking about this in, in the oscillations group as well, the way in which Viveros tries to actually flatten, and as you said, Viveros doesn't really have account, an account of strata, right? So he takes the idea that culture and nature are perspectival to sort of mean that everything is only really horizontally determined, right? So he doesn't have a sort of like perspectivism of scale that you're developing, which I think is really interesting. Um, and it, it also seems to kind of ignore a lot of stuff in the indigenous cosmologies where you do have these layered universes. Um, you have like multiple skies, right? And these skies are sort of earths for the people who live, who live on them. Um, but yeah, it's it's still a question, I guess, like how much these like multiple earths and skies relate to this Deleuzian concept of of constraint, right? Of like a formal constraint. Because um, it's unclear to me whether, I don't think it's right to describe like the sky, right? Or in, in, this, in this model is necessarily like a, a formal constraint. Whereas on the other hand, I think your, your idea that, um, the platforms as forms um, can can be predatory seems seems very Amazonian in the sense that a predator might want to kind of encompass uh, as a whole and sort of draw in um, some kind of outside and and, and absorb them. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like of rich problems that that that, that start emerging when 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 we kind of move beyond uh, the Varus's idea that everything has to be flat just because it's uh, relativistic. Yeah, like the uh, platform uh, acts like a kind of a trap in certain sense. Like this, like this is basically what I was, yeah. It, this illuminates what I was thinking of, like the platform has constraints, like kind of like a trap, like, yeah, you're, you're being preyed upon, but it's like a, it's more like a trap. You are coming willingly, and you're acting as the trap wants you to 
Mm. Yeah, you could Stuff be being like seduced, that. like yeah. like a hunter yeah, seduced, seducing yeah. the prey. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Which also yeah. turns the platform into a kind of container. So, so if, if you think about the sky too, you know, I guess I guess we could think of it like that. Um, maybe that would make more sense of the idea of it as a formal constraint. But the sky, the, the visible sky that we see is kind of a container uh, of everything that's going on on Earth, right? I think there's something... I'm, I must say that I'm really insecure about this. You know, I think there are generalizations that I might be doing, you know, like pretty much the way I feel about Deleuze and Guattari in A Thousand Plateaus, which is like, are you sure you can just say that everything works like this? You know, everything is strata that do this and do that. Like, aren't you being a bit um, too uh, specific describing this uh, in, in, in this way? And um what you said is, I think, relevant in terms of, you know, are we always going to think of, isn't this already a, a specific nomos or a specific orientation to say that the multiple variety is kind of below and then uh, the formalizations of this are the production of, of the above. And uh, in a different workshop that I was giving uh, in, in Brazil, um, an artist came up with uh, something about um, I think but some some uh, variation of Buddhist cosmology uh, which also make, made me think of like uh, Taoism uh, in, in which there was an informal sky that was uh, like there was an informal metaphysics like metaphysics not as like the Platonist world of forms, uh, you know, like, uh, but, but something which in the Deleuzian materialist framework in which, you know, the informal is, is, is materialist is, is below. And I think that's something that, that you uh, have been, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, like uh, this, like critically engaging critically with Deleuze in terms of the materialism that is implied, like, uh, whether we couldn't think of pla of a platform as something that is not just above the ground, but something that is between the ground and the, and the sky. And then what, what's the sky there, right? I, I don't really have any answers to, 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 to that, but I think it's an uh, interesting um, expansion of the field of, of possibilities and of problems that opens up when you try to, to create this kind of navigation between cosmologies, right? But I think you, you can't navigate between cosmologies without using a certain cosmology to do that, right? Uh, so if you're using perspectivism or Deleuzeanism or whatever, you're, all, you're like, even, I, I think even if you, if you say, you know, like you and, 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 and uh, other people have been saying that, you know, you always start with the center and the, and the ground and the sky. I also might think like, like, is that, is that really necessary? Or, or is that something that only is the case for for people like us who are born between a ground and a sky, like you could live like in the center, in the burning center of a, of a sun. And then maybe you would have a cosmology that wouldn't be based on a ground and a, and, and a sky. I, I think I'm, 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 I'm being very informal and uh, conversational at this point is not very rigorous, but uh, I, you, you know what I mean? Like there's some contingency to any framework that we try to use to navigate this stuff. Well, I think you're right. Like, I mean, when we're doing this navigation between cosmologies, right, we're opening up this space in which we're comparing um, topologies, right? And I, I think Lucas would have a, have a lot to say about this. Um, but we're also creating kind of a topology at the very same time, right? When we're talking about the earth in this way, when we're talking about it as layered, or when we're talking about it as spherical or the sky as a, as a container right and i think it's interesting that you start there's there seems to be some kind of transformation in the discourse that happens to a more direct kind of a cosmological thinking almost um that doesn't need to pass by necessarily or it can think alongside physics but it doesn't need to pass by it in some way
yeah well uh, thanks a lot uh, I, I i'm even like you know uh, this is actually working as a as a workshop like as i hoped it would work as a workshop in the sense that i'm uh, uh, advancing a lot in my own uh, capability to to navigate these uh, questions and i'm very happy that like uh we have like representatives of different uh positions in relation to this debate which which i i'm always like grappling uh between and trying to to mediate um yeah the idea of like the flat ontology like that's uh, to me is just like why why flat? Like why flat? Like of all of all possible. I'm surprised. Flat. I'm surprised that everybody agrees on that. Like this <laughs> yeah. like, overarching thing. What the? Why the fuck is this flat? Like, like why flat and not and not a, a point? Like or a, or or uh, you know like flat is like why two dimensional? Like why why are we inserting all all ontology in a, a two dimensional plane? Like when I'm talking about platforms. I'm not saying that everything in the universe is a platform. I'm saying that there are entities which act to produce platformity. And, and that's an operation, right? That's a, a cosmopolitical operation. It's not just like the background, like the, the given uh, point of uh, starting point of. Uh, that just a thing uh, you mentioned that uh, in the paper you mentioned that the concept of ontology for the virus is much close to that to that using computer science and systems of classification categorization and so on but uh, what would you say that is the distinctive mark of the virus conception um i think he says that at some point you know i'm i'm, I'm mentioning that because if, if i'm not mistaken if i'm not confusing him with someone else because i think like yukoi i think also says something like that like, yukoi speaks of actually like ontology and ontologies in in on the existence of digital objects and uh he says ontology in the sense of heidegger which is you know like a fundamental question of being and then ontologies is just the composition of a world right uh, what are the things there are uh, which allow me to to construct a world out of the multiplicity of um, experience um, and then to talk about that in terms of ontology is like a, a theoretical choice which i think is very like could be the, the object of a very long debate and is to uh switch from epistemology to ontology right to, to say that this is ontology and not the categories of epistemology right um but i don't know if he has like uh i don't know uh, if i can describe like what what his ontology is because he's not and this i think is is something interesting about reading and thinking with uh viveros which is uh, he's not a philosopher. Like he's he's not taking the role of of the guy who's going to have a, an ontology or a, or an, a view on ontology. Though in, at some points he does cross that line. I think as JP uh, emphasizes. Um, but the the most uh, important, most fundamental part of his work for which he's most known is this part where uh, thought is done through this anthropological, this like reverse anthropological process. And then the ontology is not something that he's articulating as a philosophical project, but something that you can um, be uh, captured by when you're studying um some some uh human group uh that has a, a different cosmology right uh, thank you i think those those two concepts of ontology can be mapped onto for instance uh, the computer science concept is very close to the analytic philosophy concept of ontology like for instance 
differently from the Heideggerian sense for when you ask, for instance, what is, is, or what does it mean, being, what mean, being means, something like that. If you take the Quinean version, for instance, it's not about what being means, even though he has kind of a trivial answer to that, it's like the value of a variable. But um, the, the guiding thread that makes him answer like that is, what are your ontological commitments? So the question is fundamentally different, you see, like instead of asking what does being mean means, he's asking what do you, what are you ontologically committed to? Like, what do you think exists? So you can think of that like the question of being as, uh, being as such and the being as whole, respectively. Uh, and the computer science concept of ontology has to do with that. Like, is what, the, what are the collections of things that are operative in this domain of experience slash world slash behavior slash whatever form of life? So something like that, you see. Uh, which is not the same as asking this uh, about the structure of the horizon appearance. Like it's more about what appears in the horizon. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Even horizon is already like a decision, right? Because it's it's yeah, also it's just because of aligned. the phenomenological tradition that I brought it up yeah, because yeah. they like to think in terms of horizon. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But like uh, you know, all of these are already sort of uh, nomic determinations of of space like minimal, minimal ones, like to, to speak of a horizon instead of a vanishing point is already a minimal determination of uh, the space that you're, that you're navigating, right? Um, I think maybe, I don't, I don't know if we should uh, wrap it up, um, continue next session. And uh, does anyone want to, to make a, uh, a final consideration. Well, uh, thanks everyone who has been uh, around. Um, next time we're going to discuss perspectivism in a more direct way and this like mobilization of, of perspectivism to understand platforms. The session is going to be called users and interfaces, animals and spirits. Um, we're already talking about users and interfaces, but we're going to um, rework that stuff through the idea of uh, animals, people and spirits and of prey and predator. And then we're going to talk a bit also about the notion of the forest encounter um, and how it's uh, relates to this big question that we are discussing about um, whether there is a general orientation or, or how the orientation happens between different uh, orientations of scale and 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 and, uh, and of levels. And uh, finally, shamanism, which already which we already touched on, as a technique of uh, of navigation so and yeah and, and our our guest uh, is going to be uh lukash likauchen though of course uh also jp and adam and everyone are going to be very um important if you appear if, if you if you show up in terms of uh keeping uh, to keep unpacking this this problematic. So th th thanks, thanks a lot, everyone who showed up and especially the ones who contributed to, to the discussion. It was really, really productive. Um, yeah, uh, see you next time, I guess. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Oh. It was very productive, yes. Uh, I'll be there next time. Thank and you, also, everyone. Let me um, just... Uh, remind you of the text uh, there's like some readings that, that are on the on the google drive uh, it's a chapter from uh, Vives de Castro's uh, the relative native the eighth chapter which is this, the first lecture on perspectivism which is like the most like fundamental center of this uh, of this whole discussion I think and then there's a chapter of uh, David Kopenawa and uh, Bruce Albert's book uh, The Falling Sky which is image and skin, and also like the second part of my 
of my talk, which talks about this stuff. But anyway, uh, I, I kind of I I, I I will take a look in the Lewis actually because this was actually crucial and we I wasn't foreseeing this. <laughs> it was going to be as crucial as it is here. Okay. Yeah, Go, going yeah. back to my Deleuze and take a look into Ray's uh, lecture about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a good one as well. Like to, to, yeah. yeah, to look at Ray's reading of Deleuze uh, and all that. That's also a good uh, good option. Also, like Ray's uh, Ray's um, workshop on foreign objects is very good as well and discusses all of that stuff. Yeah, well, thanks everyone. Yeah.